ಶ್ರೀಶೈಲೇಶದಯಾಪಾತ್ರಂ ಧೀಭಕ್ತಿಯಾದಿ ಗುಣಾರಣವಂ ಯತೀಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರವಣಂ ವಂದೇ ರಮ್ಯ ಜಾಮಾತರಂ ಮುನಿ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀನಾಥ ಸಂಭಾಂ ನಾಥ ಯಾಮುನ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರುಪರಂಪರಾ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಂ ಅಚ್ಯುತ ಪದಾಂಬುಜ ಯುಗ್ಮರುಗ್ಮ ವ್ಯಾಮೋಹತಸ್ತಿತರಿ ತ್ರಣಾಯಮೇನೆ ಅಸ್ಮದ್ಗುರೋರ್ ಭಗವತೋಸ್ ದೈಕಸಿಂಧೋ ರಾಮಾನುಜಸ್ಯ ಚರಣೌ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯಾ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದ ಸೂನವೇ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಷ್ಟ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಶೈಲೇಶಾತ್ರಿಗುಣಾರ್ಣವಂ ಯತೀಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರವಣಂ ವಂದೇ ರಮ್ಯಜಾತರಂ ಮುನಿ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀನಾಥ ಸಂಭಾಂ ನಾಥಯ ಮುನ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರಾಂ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಮಚ್ಯುತ ಪದಾಂಬುಜಯುಪರುಪ್ಪಮ್ಯಾಮೋಹತಸ್ತಿತರಿ ತೃಣಾಯಮೇನೆ ಅಸ್ಮದ್ಗುರೋರ್ ಭಗವತೋಸ್ಯದೈಕಸಿಂಧೋ ರಾಮಾನುಜಸ್ಯಚರಣೌ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದ ಸೂನವೇ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಷ್ಟ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ ಪುರುಷಕಾರ ವೈಭವಂಚ ಸಾಧನ ಗೌರವ ಪದಧಿಕಾರಿ ಕೃತ್ಯಮಸ್ಯ ಸದ್ಗುರೂಪಸೇವನ ಹರಿದಯ ಮಹೈತು ಕೀಂ ಗುರೋರುಪಾಯತಾಂಚಯ ವಚನ ಭೂಷಣೇ ವದಗುರು ತಮಾಶ್ರಯೇಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಮ್ಲಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಶೇರಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಶ್ರೀ ವೈಷ್ಣವ ಸಂಪ್ರದಾಯ an extremely evolved sampradaya which is based on strong theoretical foundations as well and which has stood the test of time for the last several millenniums of course it was systematized and brought into vogue by shri ramanuja acharya who appeared in the 11th century as we all know from which it has spread far and wide to say a very few words about the historical implications so ramanuja acharya was the first acharya to have integrated the entire world under the banner of bhakti or devotion and as we all know as you are all familiar with the bhagavad gita ramanuja acharya very clearly says there is only one path to attain liberation and that is bhakti though we we come across several statements in the upanishads as well as bhagavad gita which says jnana is also a path ramanuja acharya in most of his treatises does not even mention about jnana because human psychology is when you mention about something else apart from the main issue it will try to enquire into what is that other thing and focus is lost on the main aspect so ramanuja acharya was the first person who actually united the entire population of the world which was intending to attain liberation under the banner of bhakti and later in his lineage came several acharyas who propounded this path further we find it fine tuned it according to the needs of the people and several shining jewels that adorn this unique lineage include pillai loka acharya so i will just uh, switch on this slide so that you can get an idea of what i am talking about <coughs> so 
So I would like to say a few words about Pindaloka Acharya. And uh, even before that, I would like to extend a very warm, very warm welcome to you to this class on Mubukshupadi. So the word Mubukshupadi contains two principal segments. One is called Mubukshu and the second is known as Padi. So in the word Mubukshu is a Sanskrit word which is translated as one who desires to be liberated or one who wishes to be liberated. Moksham Ichuhu Mubukshuhu is how the word is analyzed. Moksha refers to liberation or salvation or several other words that are used in English language, which essentially means that the individual soul or the jivatma as it is known, goes beyond this cycle of births and deaths, continuous cycle of births, continuous and almost eternal cycle of births and deaths. And then attains an exalted location where he enjoys eternal bliss. Later what happens that is not the same for all the, for all the Jeevatmas because these things have been detail explained and uh, debated upon in detail in the Shri Bhashya. But there is universal acceptance that the liberated soul goes beyond the cycle of births and deaths and enjoys unlimited, unalloyed bliss. And as Jivatmas or as individual souls, all of us who are under bondage, would like to transcend this cycle of births and deaths and ultimately attain liberation. So that is why in the Indian context, we talk about the four Purusharthas. Many a times when I discuss with persons from different walks of life, different countries, especially people from outside India, I ask them, even including Indians, because many Indians are not aware of these things nowadays, younger Indians especially, what is the purpose of human life? For example, when I see a book which is in front of me, this book has been published with a particular intention. If I have a phone in front of me, that phone has been manufactured with a particular intention in mind. Similarly, we have been given this body, this birth, for a particular purpose. So what is that purpose? Can we define it? What is the objective? What is the aim of human life? This is one very important question. Many a times, by the time we contemplate on what life is all about, half or more than half of our life is over. I, come, I have come across several people who attend different classes conducted by me. So they say we are 65 years old, we are 70 years old. Though we know that liberation is the ultimate, we are not really realized that we have to strive for liberation and do something or the other for the sake of So Indian sages who started from the Vedic times and whose teachings are relevant eternally, they contemplated on this aspect more and more. And many a times, my father, who is also my Acharya, he keeps telling, Indian culture is essentially human culture, it is universal. It is not limited to the geographical location of India. So they actually defined the goals of life namely dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. So I will not go into the explanation of this because 
most of you are quite familiar with these things. And when it came to moksha, there are several theories, several different philosophies, different schools of thought, etc., which say this is what it is all about. We have the Mayavadi theories, we have several theories within the Mayavada itself. Then later also we have the Sankhya theory, we have the Yoga theory, we have the several other theories that are prevalent in the Indian philosophical context. But as we all know and as we are pursuing, it is the philosophy of Vishishta Dvaita propounded by Raman Jacharya, which has Vaishnavism as its practical aspect, which has been able to deliver maximum, with maximum potency, the way to attain liberation to the spiritual aspirants, to the mumukshus, as they are called in philosophical parlance. So here I would like to stress about a few fundamental issues which are greatly confused people and the people do not know the distinction between these two things. This is widely prevalent across India where people are people seem to be familiar with the philosophies of the Sampradaya etc. But they are not exactly knowing what Vishishta Advaita philosophy is and what Sampradaya is. Sri Vaishnavism is used in used as a synonym to Vishishta Advaita. So in the Vishishta Advaita philosophy, because now the I, I suppose the aim of this class is to understand the fundamentals of our philosophy and also our Sampradaya, which is the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya in a proper context, proper per perspective. I am mentioning about these things. So, the <clears throat> when we talk about our philosophy and religion, it is the philosophy of Vishishta Advaita. We have it is only in the Ramanuja Sampradaya, Ramanuja Siddhanta, we have two distinct portions, two distinct categories. One category is known as the Shastra Bhaga, and the second category is known as the Sampradaya Bhaga. So we have the philosophy aspect which is given as Shastra Bhaga, which very clearly defines the strong theoretical foundations of the religion of Sri Vaishnavism. And the Sampradaya Bhaga is given by the word Sri Vaishnavism, which is actually the practical application of what is mentioned in the Vishishta Advaita Siddha. So when you compare this with other philosophies, other religions, for example, when you take Christianity, I'm not, uh, I would like to first mention that what I'm mentioning is not in, intended to belittle any sampradaya, any philosophy or anything, just it's a contrast to know the speciality of our sampradaya, our philosophy. So when you take philosophies like uh, sorry, religions like Christianity and Islam, they don't have a philosophy to back them up. They don't have any theoretical foundations that are given by, as a separate field based on which the philosophy religion is practiced. Similarly, when you take the philosophy of Sankhya or Advaita in the Indian context, it is seen that they don't have a religion. So Advaita says it's, uh, it is generally called as Mayavada by some people. So whether it's the right word or not, that's a different issue which I am not going to touch now. But it says the Jivatma and Paramatma, the individual soul and the supreme soul are one and the same. So then where does the question of sadhana or where does the question of practice come? Because once it is decided that they both are one and the same, what else needs to be done is the question. So it does not have a religion 
or a practical aspect. It ends with the theory, theory only. And the religions like Christianity and uh, uh, Islam, they do not have philosophical foundations. Similarly, when we talk about the philosophy of Plato, of Socrates, etc., they are actually known as armchair philosophers, where they will just be sitting on an armchair and speculating. Of course, it doesn't mean that they are belittling them or telling them that they are not good. But it ends there, it ends with some intellectual activity. It has nothing to do with any practical issue. That is why it has been mentioned that philosophy without religion is lame and religion without philosophy is blind. So the uniqueness of the Siddhanta or of the philosophy propounded by Ramanuja Acharya is he named the philosophy portion, the Siddhanta portion or the Shastra portion as Vishishtadvaita. And if one has to practically implement the philosophy, it is known as Sri Vaishnavism, which is known as the Sampradaya Bhava. So, as I mentioned, in India itself, there is a huge misconception that these two terms, essentially technical terms, are actually used as synonyms to each other, which is totally wrong. So, the theoretical foundation aspect or the theoretical portion is mentioned as, is named as Vishishta Advaita. Whereas the practical aspect is known as Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, which is known as Sampradaya. So the Shastra Bhaga gives the theoretical aspects and the application of the theoretical aspects in a very unique, versatile, comprehensive manner is given in the Sampradaya Bhaga known as Sri Vaishnava. So how does one actually study this? So we have to actually, as I mentioned, philosophy without religion is lame and religion without philosophy is blind. So if a person has to move forward, he has to be able to see and he also has to be able to move. So philosophy and religion complement each other in a very unique manner. That is why a great philosopher called P. N. Srinivas Achari mentions Vishishta Advaita is the only Siddhanta or it is the only philosophy which is the philosophy of a religion. Others are purely religions or purely philosophies. They are not interconnected to each other in a way that this philosophy is connected with a religion. So this is a very important and unique aspect that one has to know as far as our Shastra and our Sampradaya is concerned. So coming to the <coughs> study of these two aspects are concerned. As I mentioned, there are two works that concern the Shastra Bhaga, the philosophy aspect, and two works that are associated with the Sampradaya Bhaga, the practical aspects. So <coughs> we have the two Sanskrit treatises authored by Bhagavan Ramanuja Acharya. That is the Sri Bhashyam, which is a commentary on the Brahma Sutras of Sage Vyasa, or Badarayana as he is known in his own words. And then you have the Gita Bhashyam of Ramanuja Acharya, which is a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, where he very systematically systematizes the instructions given in the Bhagavad Gita. Because many a times people may wonder what is the need for a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is authored in the most simplest Sanskrit possible. So what is the need for a commentary? I will not go into those details because that's a very vast topic in, in itself. Because we come across several objections that are raised on the Bhagavad Gita where it says there are several contradictions. In one place it says jnana is may the main path, in another place it says bhakti, in another place it says karma. So there are several contradictions in the Gita like that many people say. But 
it is not so and this has this aspect has been very well brought out by ramanand acharya who has contributed in a very unique manner to reach the message of the bhagavad gita to the masses so these two treatises are most important as far as the philosophy portion of the shastra vedanta is concerned that is the shri bhashya and the gita bhashya then when it comes to practically implementing the philosophy we have the sampradaya bhaga that is the shri vaishnavism portion which has two principal works that is the bhagavad vishaya and then the rahasya rahasya granthas so the bhagavad vishaya means the commentary on the tiruvai moli of namalva so namalva as we know is the greatest 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 devotee past present and future we can very safely say and many a times people from iskon don't know now it's not their fault of course but to say a few words about namalvar and his relationship with lord krishna it is said that rishim jushamahe krishna trishna tatva nivodita so namalvar was the personification of the thirst of bhakti thirst which was actually quenched by lord krishna so he is the personification of krishna trishna tatva or the reality which is the longing for the experience of krishna in all aspects in all aspects in mind in body in soul etc etc right that is why he says unnum shoru paraham neer tinnam metthale ellam kanna so he says the food i consume the water i drink and also the beetle leaves that are consumed after consuming food everything for me is dark krishna on the end nothing more so in sanskrit when it's analyzed in a philosophical manner we need three things to sustain ourselves that is known as dharaka poshaka and bhogya dharaka is that which is required to sustain life in this body and that is food so items like rice dal etc so without food a person cannot survive then for the food to be digested and to be taken to all parts of the body we need water which is known as poshaka and though the human needs basic needs ends with dharaka and poshaka that is food and water still people feel they want to enjoy something and that is mentioned as bhogya that is object of enjoyment which is given here as innum vetle in indian tradition after a very great meal a feast is consumed a person has a meal that is associated with a feast or a feast full meal generally they use they have beetle leaves with beetle nuts so it enhances the taste of the food it helps the food to be uh, digested properly there are several uh, positive aspects of course no negative aspects unless it is consumed too much so from the point of view of wellness also it is very important which i not going to so namalvar says all these three are not krishna only for me because he never consumed any food physically during his life so in the tiruvai moli we see that how from the beginning to the end that is what are the, what is the beginning of bhakti where is the beginning of bhakti how it starts how it progresses in the process of the progression of bhakti where the sharanagati are the most unique aspect of shri vaishnava philosophy that is surrender comes 
and ultimately what happens to the person who is a devotee how the lord himself takes the responsibility of taking the devotee to liberation the very beautiful aspect or unique aspect of the krivai mudi of namal varis before he is granted liberation the entire description of the archiradi marga which is available only in the upanishads no other no other alvar has experienced the archiradi marga and mentioned it in any sort of words and what namalvar has mentioned is totally in consonance with what has been mentioned in the upanishads as far as the archiradi marga is concerned where the liberated soul travels from this world to the vaikuntha loka how he is welcomed there what all what all happens in, during the process everything is beautifully described by namalva which no other alva or no other saint in any film sampradaya has mentioned i can say that without any hesitation so we see that we have eh, the greatest model of a devotee a bhakta a sharanagata a prapanna as he is called in shri vaishnava parlance in namalva and to know the nuances of the stanzas more than 1500 stanzas composed by namalva in four of his works we need the commentaries of our purvacharyas who adorned the lineage among whom pillalokacharya is one of the greatest shining stars so as far as the sampradaya bhaga the practical aspect is concerned we need to study the commentary of the commentaries in fact there are five commentaries actually commentaries of the trivai mudi of the malva which is the greatest which is one of the greatest uh, topics of study a person can ever have then what happens how does he practically implement what should he do so now a person studies the shri bhashyam he studies the gita bhashyam then later he studies the bhagavad vishyam also then he asks what should i do then the question the answer is given in the rahasya granthas which are the secret teachings as you know rahasya means secret so secret teaching regarding the practical aspects of shri vishnu which is given by pilloka acharya in his ashtadash rahasyas or 18 rahasya granthas that he has authored so now today suppose a person takes the shri vishnu diksha he takes samashrayana what he what does he have to do the answer is given by the first work in this series which is mubukshupadi here the question arises why is it that it is called rahasya why is it that it is called secret teachings because once you have authored it and published it where is the secrecy so today it's available online uh, is it <coughs> appropriate to call it as rahasya granthas so my acharya used to tell me that earlier these would not be written down they would not be committed to writing they were given from guru to shishya guru to shishya guru to shishya in this lineage but due to the deterioration of the standard of human beings over a period of time there came a situation where <clears throat> it occurred to the great acharyas like pulladoka acharya that if these things are not written down if they are not committed to write in uh, writing if they are not recorded in a written form then there may be much dilution 
and ultimately the knowledge may be lost for posterity. Therefore, though it is known as Ransa Granthas, they had to commit it, commit it to writing and mention all the aspects associated with the practical aspect of Sri Vaishnavism in what is known as the Rasya Granthas. That is the 18 works authored by Pidaloka Acharya, which are known as the Ashtarasha Rahasas. So this includes several of his works like Sri Vajana Bhushana, Parandapadi, etc., which is the list is available online and you can have it. So Pralaloka Acharya was in a way the greatest Acharya who committed to writing all the Rahasya aspects and the practical aspects that Sri Vaishnava has to follow. So many a times when we talk about what are the issues, how it includes how a person Sri Vaishnava has to conduct himself in his personal life. How he has to respect his Acharya. How he has to respect his disciples. For example, in the Sri Vaishnava Bhojana, I will mention just one sample. In the Sri Vaishnava Bhojana, he says, if a Guru or Acharya thinks that I am the Acharya and the person who is the Shishya is his disciple, he will cease to be an Acharya in the real sense of the term. He should never think that I am the Acharya. So he should think that I am the instrument in the hands of my Acharya and I am the representative of my Acharya. Then how should he treat his Shishya or disciple? So, since though he himself has initiated his Shishya, his disciple into the path of Sri Vaishnavism, he should treat his Shishya as his co-disciple, uh, co-student, as his classmate. Because both I and my Shishya, my so-called my disciple, have been initiated to Sri Vaishnavism by my Acharya. So he should treat his own disciple as his classmate. He should never say, I am your guru and you are my shishya. If he says that he ceases to be a guru. Can we imagine this today? So this is how Pralaloka Acharya has beautifully enumerated what are the values that the Sri Vaishnava has to follow. This is only the tip of the iceberg I mentioned. So that is why Manavala Mahabuni, who succeeded Pralaloka Acharya, who is known as Varavara Muni, who commented upon all the works of Pralaloka Acharya, he is known as Vyakhyana Chakravarti or the Emperor Ramang commentators. Because in Sanskrit, a poet, a commentator who comments on a poetry, he says, Na moolam likhyate kinchin nana pekshita mukshyate. I will not write anything that is not there in the original. And I will never tell anything that is not required as far as the context is concerned. So, there are several types of commentaries in Sanskrit. In fact, that is a huge ocean in itself. In Sanskrit, we have what we call as Vritti Granthas, we have Bhashya Granthas, we have Vartika Granthas, we have Yakyanas. All these are different. In fact, the Vyakhyana Parampara of the Sri Vaishnava philosophy itself is a huge, huge topic which needs to be explained over several uh, days or months. But in this context, the great works of the great Saint Pudaloka Acharya were commented upon by Manavala Mamani, who is known as the Vyakhyana Chakravarti, who very beautifully brought out the inner meanings 
of the works of Pilaroka Acharya and expounded it and gave it to ordinary people like us. And Manavana Mamani himself was one of the greatest exponents of the as the practitioner of all the values mentioned in Sri Vaishnavas. This is well evident when we see the when you study his Dinacharya. So we have <coughs> in Sri Vaishnava philosophy, especially in the Chandracharya philosophy, we come across a very beautiful work called Sri Varavaramuni Dinacharya. What was the daily routine of the great Manavala Mamani or Varavaramuni? What were the things that he was doing? He was doing from morning to night. How he would conduct himself with his fellow devotees, with his disciples. How, what was his disposition towards God. All these things are beautifully enumerated in the Varavaramuni Dhanicharya, which, which was authored by his direct disciple called Yerimbiyapar Devaraj who was one of his eight most important shishyas or disciples, who are known as Ashtadigadas. So as much as the Mumukshupadi work itself is important, we have to know the stories or the historical occurrences of the Acharyas, which is very important in the reforming ourselves into Great Sri Vaishnavas. So, as I mentioned, the fourth aspect is the Rahasya Grantha, the sacred teachings regarding the practical aspects of Sri Vaishnavas. So, we see that the Sri Bhashim and Gita Bhashim are two most important works that explain the philosophy portion of the Shastra Bhaga. And then the Bhagavad Vishyam and Rahasyam, which are the two most important works. Of course, Rasya Grantha is not one work. It is several works. But the principal works are Mamukshupadi and Sri Vachana Bhushnam and Acharya. And other subsidiary works are in a way complementary and supplementary to these works. So the way it is studied is first we study Mamukshupadi, then we just study Sri Vachana Bhushnam. And then we study Acharya Hargim, which is actually a summary of the Tiruvai Muri of Namadva in a practical manner. Which is once again a highly exalted work, which was authored by Adahi Manavada Pirumal Nayanar, who was the younger brother of Tiluloka. So with this brief introduction, I go to the next slide. One more very important aspect is to be known here what is known as the Kalakshepa tradition. So some of you might have heard the word Kalakshepa. It's a very significant word in Sri Vaishnava philosophy, Sri Vaishnava religion or Sri Vaishnava sampradaya. So Kalakshepa literally means wailing away one's time. That is actually, <clears throat> now for example, we are in the midst of a lockdown. So how do you pass your time? Many people ask or ask each other. How do you spend your time? So it is known as the shape or passing away or throwing away time. Many times when we travel by flight or when we travel in a train, when we are also bored to read something or chant something, in, uh, especially in Karnataka, in Bangalore and other places, when we are traveling, traveling in a train, you have this uh, hawkers or vendors who come with, uh, who actually uh, uh, sell different eatables. So among one of those eatables that are sold is what they call, as they say, time pass kandaka. So if you are unable to pass your time doing something worthwhile, you have to eat something. And they actually sell the salted peanuts. And it is really called time pass kadlaka. When they say time pass kadlaka, time pass kadlaka, they announce. And many a times, even, I am not sure how, uh, 
How many of you have experienced? When you have uh, nothing to do and you are bored of doing something, you feel like eating something, though you might, your stomach is full and uh, you are not hungry, you feel like eating something. So we try to go into the kitchen and try to actually search for something if there is something to eat, some chocolate or something, as the case may be. So sometimes what happens, it is very difficult for people to while away their time. But that is not what Kalakshepa really means. So time has to be spent in the most meaningful manner. And how is to be how time is to be spent? Because one cannot eternally eat, eternally enjoy the pleasures of life. Only for a few years or even in those years for some limited periods of time we can enjoy everything. Even if you have to eat some very 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 tasty prasadams as they are prepared in our sampradaya. Because only in Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya all the food is sati and each food has a huge significance. Because for example we say Shakara Pungal which is a very unique dish prepared in Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya only. This has been mentioned by the great Andal herself. So this has a very great significance. And she talks about a Pal Shoru or Kshiram, which is prepared in a very unique manner in our exalted uh, Kshetra called Melkote or Trinarayana. Like this, there are several delicacies prepared in various Divya Deshas. But for how long can you eat and how much can you eat? Especially if it's uh, sweet, you can only consume this much or a little bit more. You cannot consume it like you can consume curd rice. Curd rice every day we eat rice. We don't feel, uh, we enjoy it. But suppose it is payasam or something like that. If you say, if, if every day payasam is prepared in the house, we say, no, no, I don't want to have payasam. So any pleasure, it can be enjoyed only for a limited period of time. And in those days, we did not have these gadgets, we did not have this type of um, what we call as vocational work, where you work for 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, doing meaningless things, or things that are not conducive to your, conducive to your spiritual progress. So you had what is known as passing of time, or using, utilizing time, which is the right word, by experiencing the great pastimes of our Purvacharyas, of persons like Nambalva, where in the commentaries you have Ramayana, you have Mahabharata, you have so many different types of uh, enjoyments which are totally in line with the enjoyments prescribed for a devotee. And it is totally aesthetic in nature, it is conducive for a spiritual uh, progress. It is, uh, it actually does away, it does away all the stress a person has. And it grants him great spiritual evolution, not only spiritual evolution, mental evolution also. So, this is what the Kalakshepa method is where much of the time of the Acharyas and Shishyas, the preceptors and the disciples was spent in reading these works, works these four works which was to be studied. And there is a tradition in the teaching methodology also where the Acharya has to start the teaching after the Shishyas or disciples have chanted all the Tanians are the Dhyana Shlokas or the propitiatory verses. And also how it is to be done, etc. It is a long process which I will explain another, another, another day. And with whom this Kalakshepa has to be done? It has to be done from an Acharya. But many a times what happens? The Acharya who initiates us, gives the Samashrenam or the Pancha Samskara, he may not be available full time. Then what happens? 
you a person a Shiva Ishtama is permitted to have Kalakshetam from another Acharya. So that is why in Shiva Ishtama parlance we have two types of Acharyas. One is known as the Uttaraka Acharya, the, per the preceptor who helps the devotee transcend the mortal world. That is the person who actually gives the Pancha Samskara or the <coughs> fivefold sacrament, which is known as Tapaha, Pundraha, Tatha, Nama, Mantro, Yagascha, Panchamaha. So, do you want me to explain the these five things, or are you already familiar with it? Uh, Swami, I think everyone is familiar with uh, with uh, Pancha Samskara. So, there are several nuances that need to be explained, which I will do so whenever there is a. Uh, question or uh, if there is any uh, new thing that needs to be explained. So he is known as the Uttaraka Acharya because he is the person who actually helps the person transcend this mortal world by means of initiating the devotee into the Sri Vaishnava faith. And then you have the Upakaraka Acharya who is the subsidiary preceptor. And there can be several preceptors like this, several Upakaraka Acharyas. He need not be one. So the principal Acharya is the Uttaraka Acharya or the person who gives the Panchasamskaras. Whereas the Utta, Upakaraka Acharya is the subsidiary preceptor who helps the devotee or Shiva Vaishnava in learning about all these things. That is the Granta Chatushtiyas. Sometimes the Uttaraka Acharya himself may be able to teach this which may be an ideal situation. But many a times that may not be possible because of the absence of physical proximity. The Acharya might be stay, staying in another place and the Shishya might be staying in another place. And in those days we did not have software facilities like this, which, is, which have come in the last five, ten years. So they had this concept of Uttaraka Acharya and Upakaraka Acharya. And one very important thing that is to be noted is all these concepts are unique to Sri Vaishnava philosophy only. In no other religion or philosophy or tradition, you have these highly evolved concepts. And I am mentioning these things because they are not generally known to people who are in Shri, even those who are initiated into Sri Vaishnava Sampada. So, <clears throat> we have two types of preceptors and in one of the Rahasya Granthas, it is said that there is a beautiful saying in Tamil, it says, what is wrong if two persons, suppose a person has fallen into a well and he has to be rescued. What is wrong if two persons descend to the well and rescue him? Is there anything wrong if two people do it? Is it necessary that only one people has one person has to do it? So here the person who has fallen into the well is the Jivatma or the individual soul who is bound by the samsara. And the person who is who has been bound is actually taken up from the well of samsara by the Acharya who leads him to the well. So, very beautifully, Vrindadoka Acharya mentions in the Shri Vachana Bhutti. He says, Acha Bhagaval Labham Acharya Nade and Acharya Labham Bhagavan Nade. An extremely beautiful statement which I have not come across in any other place. So, one gets access to the God, to the Supreme Lord Narayana by means of the Acharya. And how does one get such an Acharya who will lead him to God? It is by Lord by the grace of Lord Narayana. So one acquires an Acharya by the grace of Lord Narayana. And one acquires the grace of Lord Narayana by means of the Acharya. Such a beautiful statement. So these are the two types of Acharyas <coughs> who help the individual soul who is bonded. 
overcome his bondage and ultimately reach moksha the exalted abode of vaikuntha and what is the definition of an acharya it is very important because unless you know we know the greatness of an acharya we will not be able to appreciate his upadesha or his instruction it is mentioned as achinoti hi shastrani acharye sthapayanti svayam acharyate asmati tasmad acharya ichchhi this has to be explained in great detail in sanskrit there is a saying alpa arambha kshema karah so we have taken about one hour so far so <clears throat> today i will conclude my exposition here so um swami swami uh i have got a little bit of a question here um i very much appreciated the overview and um but can you say why is it that uh, you decided to jump right into rahasya granthas rather than giving a basis of uh, vishishta dvaita philosophy before doesn't it, it seems like the vishishta dvaita should come first and after that uh, go to the rahasya books ah uh, yes it's uh, during our discussions we start we thought that we will uh, start with mumukshu pati itself so i will now have not more about the uh, siddhartha bhaga ashram and gita bhasha i will uh, if you if you necessary i can uh, spend about one hour or so on one of these before we go into the text to deal about that so for your information we are uh, we are going through uh, gita art sangraha with uh, dr tirunaraina of uh, sri rangam and we have uh, we're about 3 or 3 or 4 uh, verses into gita art sangraha with the raksha commentary of vedanta deshika so i think it's uh, it's a ba- it's more basic uh, and everyone who is uh, attending has read bhagavad gita of course but uh, perhaps not the gita bhashya of sri pad ramanujacharya so there might be some differences we Uh, a lot of us are coming from uh, some of us of course uh, are sri vaishnavas from birth but uh, some of most of us are coming from a background of iskon so we know the bhagavad gita of uh, iskon uh, yes. and we need to understand what differences and similarities there are with that text and that commentary from the commentary of uh, sri pad ramanujacharya sure sure so i just want as you said you wanted the uh, feedback um about the structure of your class i just wanted to say um i very much appreciate the structure of your class and the slides um being able to see something um visual learning also in addition to while you're speaking um is very very helpful so i appreciate that very very much thank you so much what is the situation um swami for um bhagavad vishayam uh, those works are in tamil mainly for those who cannot speak tamil those uh, prapannas who cannot speak or read tamil um is it that you know just kalakshepam you know via someone who can explain the bhagavad gita yes. yes. in yes. english because i don't know how many translations like you know those books are translated translations have come but uh, it does not uh, translations can only complement the teaching of uh, an acharya so it is better to learn it from an acharya so the upanishad says acharya dhyevahi sa vidya vidya sa adhishtam prapat so suppose you you want to learn football or soccer as you people call it there might be several manuals but unless you learn it from a person who has played football it then only it matters so you cannot see a manual and learn football or any sport for that matter i so agree the manuals are there to supplement the human teaching so an acharya can never be substituted by anything else exactly tad vidhi pranipati na yes 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 so anyway thank you so much swami you you mentioned you mentioned uh, mumukshu pari and you also mentioned uh, shrivatsa bhushanam shrivatsana bhushanam by uh, pilalokacharya and uh, acharya hridayam 
and uh, but uh, can you can I ask you uh, why you did not mention Upadesha Ratnamala? Oh, Upadesha Ratnamala, of course, that is uh, Upadesha Ratnamala is a work by Manavana Mamuni, which is which actually gives the days and dates of the uh, uh, appearances of our Alvars and Acharyas. So, and then he goes on to, that is done in the first 30 stanzas. And then in the next uh, few stanzas, next about 15 stanzas, he talks about the different commentaries of Thiruvayamuni. So it is more of a, so, a chronological uh, account of the dates and days that they and remember. I, and I think uh, at the end of it, 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 it becomes more of a Mahatmyam or a glorification ah, of Sri Vachana Bhushan. And he mentions about the greatness of Sri Vachana Bhushan, etc. It has to be learned definitely and understood. But uh, yeah, like you said, it's uh, more of a uh, historical account hmm. of the Alvars and Acharyas, how to remember the, the dates of their appearance and how for, for sake of uh, celebration, etc. Of course, that is a very important work that everybody needs to know. But as far as the uh, Sampradaya knowledge is concerned, this is very important. These are the traces that need to be learned. Of course, all with the commentaries of Manavada Mamani. Uh, and also, just for your information, we, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Tirunarayana, we are going through uh, several uh, Rahasya Granthas of uh, Deshika Sampradaya. Yes, that's so also very important. So there's very little difference, but uh, there may be a few differences, and we may ask you to opine on the... At the basic level, uh, it doesn't matter much, but at the... Uh, Philosophy level, there are uh, what they call Ashtarasha Bhedas of the 18 uh, ideological viewpoints. Yeah, uh, yeah each, uh, each one has its own merits. So, that is also very important. Shri Shaila Shadaya Patram Dibhatya Di Gunarnavam Yatindra Pravanam Vande Ramya Javataram 